So, so um, tomorrow, it's President's Day. The reason I remember it is because I'm off. It helps me to remember. But you know that uh, tomorrow is President's Day. It's a U.S. holiday that honors all past and even present presidents of the United States. And as I think about all the presidents, although all of them contributed, one of them kind of stands out to me, and that was President Franklin Roosevelt. And he stands out to me because really of the situation, if you remember what happened during his, his term, uh, it, it really stood out to me because on December of 1941, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, right? And, and I thought about that as I thought about President's Day as I was thinking through that. And, and the bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese, interestingly enough, it began a unity in the United States that as Christians, that as Christians, it's important for us to understand in the light of our beliefs. And we'll talk a little more about that here. But um, one writer wrote this. He said, within a matter of hours of the attack on America... America is now moving quickly to get on a war footing. American attitudes about the war changed radically, as do American attitudes about the economy and about giving to war. Do you, uh, and it made me think as he wrote that, and, and I'm going to read the rest of it, it made me think about, you know, we talk about giving and things like that. Uh, th- we, when, you, when, when we give the tithe, that's the 10%. That's not the offering. That's not above and beyond. We give to the war. The war on the souls that the devil wants to steal and destroy. So he says, he says that the United States basically changed their mentality about giving even to the war. And then he goes on. He says, the war is not part of the culture. The war is the culture, he writes. Wow, right? Everything he goes on is viewed through the prism of the war effort. He says virtually all movies have a war theme. Virtually everybody gets up in the morning thinking about what can I do to support the war effort. Children are doing scrap drives, paper drives, metal drives, you know, rubber drives, grease drives, whatever they can to get money. Nobody has a new car for a a long time because Detroit stops making new cars. If you remember that, Detroit stopped making new cars because they started making bombs or they started putting manufacturing stuff together for the war effort, right? And then he goes on, he says, the writer completes this section here by saying, there are stricter regulations on travel for a lot of people, especially Japanese Americans, German Americans, Italian Americans, and he stops there. And then as I thought about this, I don't know, but do you know that after this bombing, there were even rumors about how San Francisco and Los Angeles were going to be invaded and bombed? That, they were, that was the scare. That was the scare. The scare was that the J- Japanese were going to come um, to the Midway, right? You know the story of the Midway, that they were going to come through Midway. That was going to be the gateway through which they invaded the U.S. That was going to be the gateway through which they came and took over the U.S. But you see, at the time, what's interesting is despite all the differences of religion and differences of political views, they had them back then, right? You know, the differences in cultural views, all the differences that existed then, just like it is today. Despite all those differences, the differences melted away. Those differences melted away and the focus became fighting this thing that threatened the freedom of the United States. All those differences melted away. As I thought about this, the interesting thing was that this threat, it didn't just threaten freedom, catch this, but really it threatened the freedom to be different. It threatened each and every individual's little kingdoms they'd built within this freedom. And what do I mean by that? I mean, it threatened, you know, we had all kinds of different religions back then. We had all kinds of different beliefs. And even then, they argued about these different things. But when this threat that threatened the ability to think different, to have separate things, whenever that that was threatened, they came together. 
The U.S. came together to defend the freedom of their differences, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. You know, we understand this because we know that even today we have many different differences. <laughs> we have differences that amongst each other, we may even fight about them. Religious differences, political differences. But if something comes in, and hear me here, if something comes in and threatens the individual freedom, our little kingdoms to be different, to think the way we want, we will fight against it. You know, this, is no diff this was no different back in the time of Jesus as we continue our study in John. You know, today we're in chapter 11, verse 45 through 57. I'll say it again, chapter 11, 45 uh, through 57, this is of John. Now, through his miracles, Jesus has been, been attracting more and more people, gaining more and more followers, as we've read through here, right? A lot of the attention has been uh, attracting, has been negative. This attraction has been a negative attention because Jesus appears to be performing the miracles on the Sabbath, and there's a law against this. This is against the Jewish law. Through this attention, Jesus has been trying to get the religious leaders to see who he is, the Son of God. The Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. If by no other means, at least through the miracles, he has been showing them. As we read in chapter 10. But they picked up stones at least a couple of times before this, and they wanted to stone him. Hmm. Now, Jesus has just performed the greatest miracle of all up to this point. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus has been dead in the tomb for four days. And this was a miracle because the Jews had seen and believed that somebody could be, you know, uh, resuscitated, whatever the case may be, after three days. We talked about that. We know that that was historically a fact. It's written somewhere. But after the third day, huh, never. They'd never seen anybody risen after the third day. And now here it's four days. Isn't there a stench in the tomb, Martha says? Get up, Lazarus. It's what we heard Jesus say last week. So we have to remember that Jews believe that someone, this couldn't happen. But see, Matthew 19, 26 reminds us of something. It says, with God, all things are possible. Do you believe that? Do we truly believe that with God, all things are possible? Through Him, in Him, through Him, and in Him, all things are possible. Somebody say amen. amen. That means let it be, right? It is true. Verse 45 through 47. Read with me, please. The Word of God. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in Him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called the meeting a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Well, the Sanhedrin is both composed of Pharisees and Sadducees, just so you know that. They're, they're composed of the religious, religious leaders. And one thing we see here in these first two verses is that there are two different groups here. There's those who put their faith in him, and there are those who went and told on him. One thing we see here is clear. The presence of Jesus will drive a decision one way or the other. When Jesus appears, you're going to have to choose. In terms of those who chose to put their faith in him, you know, very little is said in this text about, you know, the specifics about what happened. But what we do know about those who put their faith in Jesus, according to James, is they're busy about doing God's work. They put their faith in Him. That means they put their trust in Him. That means they obeyed Him. And in James 2, 15 through 17, it reads this, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied, if, not, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. I think that's important for us who understand faith. Our faith without an action 
is dead. Our faith without action is dead. Say, let's say that together. My faith without action is dead. When we read the Bible, it's, uh, it's a message to us over and over for those who have come to faith in God, built around the Great Commission, which is Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. I am surely with you always to the very end of the age. This is what the people of faith are to do. This is the command. See, Jesus puts this believer to work, both working to increase our faith and winning the lost who are coming to him in faith. When we are Christ, we do not wait. I want you to hear this, folks. When, we, when we're in Christ, we don't wait to graduate from the university of I can now witness to win the lost. We don't graduate from that. When we come to, to, to the Lord, we don't wait till we graduate from this, uh, I know everything I need to know about Jesus, now I can go witness university. No, no, no. The, the, the graduation is, I believe. The graduation ceremony is, I repent and I believe. And I give my life to Christ. Because your testimony your testimony of that is the book you use to teach others. See, we don't wait to graduate. See, this is the faith. These people, it doesn't say a whole lot about what the people did after they came to faith in him, but we know that the Bible teaches us about this. On the other hand, though, the things that followed those who did not put their faith in him, their behavior, their actions, um, they're described in a little more detail. And, and really, the reason that happens a lot of times is because God continues to help us and through the warnings of the Scripture, He helps us to see through the warnings of the Scripture how we should not be. Praise God for that. I praise God for that. You know, the passage tells us some, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now, it doesn't say anything in there that they didn't believe what Jesus had done. They didn't, they didn't say anything. There was, it was just right in front of their faces. They said they went and told the Pharisees what he had done. They made a choice. Now, this was only going to be the beginning of the actions of those who had not put their faith in him. Uh, so let's read on to understand uh, the remaining detail and the results of these people. Verse 47b. What are we accomplishing? Who's asking this question? The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees who have now come together. They asked, what are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is the man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. He's talking to the whole Sanhedrin. You do not realize that it is better for you, better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for the ceremony, ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. 
So those who had not placed their faith in Jesus had come to tell the Pharisees, and even the Pharisees themselves, they, they couldn't disprove anything that Jesus had done here. They could not deny his power. They, they knew that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. They knew the devil was not good. So there was something they, they there was nothing that they could dispute. They couldn't dispute this thing. Lazarus had been dead for four days. He brought, brought him back from the dead, and there were many people that were eyewitnesses. There was nothing they could dispute. You see, they weren't concerned so much with others believing in Jesus. They didn't care that others believed in Jesus. They were more concerned about the consequences to them if others believed and followed Jesus. How would this affect them? For the religious leaders, Jesus was one who has come to invade their freedom. He's come to invade their freedom. He was one who was disrupting their little kingdoms. How are we doing? Do we allow God to disrupt our little kingdoms? See, Jesus comes to disrupt our kingdoms if it is not based on the kingdom of God. Any kingdom that is not based on the kingdom of God will be up for disruption. Praise God and amen. So those who had seen Jesus do what he did, you know, who had then reported this to the Pharisees and saw the, the, you know, the disruption of the kingdoms and they told the Pharisees because the Pharisees at the time are in control of what they see as their kingdom. See, you wonder why they went to tell him. They went to tell him because in their minds they understood what this meant too. And they're going to go to the ones who could potentially help them to make this not happen. What's interesting about this situation in relation to the earthly kingdom, though, is that the religious leaders had set up was this. They were now placing their differences aside for the sake of their kingdom on earth. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were now placing their differences aside for their agenda. Despite their differences, their kingdoms, however different they might have been, their existing kingdoms were at stake. Caiaphas knew the implications of Jesus following, others uh, following Jesus and believing in. He understood this. Caiaphas, the high priest at the time, says to all the Sanhedrin present, but both Pharisees and Sadducees, in that verse 49 and 52, he says, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. See, in his mind, in his mind, he's, when he talks about the whole nation perishing, he's thinking about the Romans coming in and taking over because he understood that if people follow Jesus, they might, there might be an uprising somewhere. There might be an uprising there. So he knew that. But I love the way John puts this back into context. One of the commentaries that I read captured this as saying this, the devil instigated his thought, but God overruled his words. The office of the high priest spoke, not Caiaphas. See, this was a prophecy, a revolt of the Jewish people against both the J Jewish leaders and perhaps the Roman government would lead to everything being taken away from them. Their current freedom to worship as they chose, their freedom to rule the, the Jewish people under their authority as they saw fit. Although they were still under the watchful eyes of the Roman government and although the Romans were even uh, the ones who controlled who and who was not the high priests, they chose that. They, they got to choose that. What the Jewish leaders had then, right then, even though they had differences, was better than not having it at all. Do we settle there sometimes, folks? Jesus is calling us to a different level in our lives, a different spiritual growth in our lives. And, and, the, and, and the kingdom that we're living in right now, we know has to be destroyed. And, 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 and we want to stay there because what we have now is better than, than not having it at all. See, this was where they were. This was where they were. This was what blinded them.
better than having everything taken away from them. And if Jesus kept doing what he was doing and more and more and people would come to him and believe in him and follow him, their entire kingdom was threatened. This would mean absolute doom for the earthly kingdom, for all they'd held on and worked for for so many centuries. You you might recall or, or may not know that even before Jesus came into the picture, there was always contention between these Pharisees and the Sadducees. Just to give you an idea, uh, and the idea is really here how they came together. There, it, even recently, we read a couple of weeks ago in John 9, 16 and 10, 19 through 11, how the religious leaders were divided amongst themselves about whether to believe in Jesus or not. They were in, it was in the text, right? But even more so, you may or may not know that the Pharisees and Sadducees also had different beliefs about the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. The thing they based their life on. The Sadducees maintained that the Torah, first five books of the Bible, were the greatest authority on God's will for the Jews. In contrast, the Pharisees believed that God did not just provide the Jews with the written law, which was the Torah, but also the oral law, which was compromised of oral tradition and revelation that were given to the Jews. The prophets, Moses, and other people, right? So the Torah was complemented by that. Essentially, the Pharisees believed that God permits man to interpret the Torah by exercising their reasoning abilities to apply different laws and existing prob- to existing problems. So, th- so they, were, th- they were different in what they believed here. I don't know if you know that the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church, when it was the Catholic Church, was the only church. And we, a lot of times, we believe that that this big, uh, you know, separation, this reformation happened with Martin Luther and these others. Well, that wasn't the first time the church had divided. There was a big thing called a schism. And that schism was when the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox Catholics separated. And they were separating because they were arguing about what the Spirit really was all about. And all they had to do was ask the Spirit. We think it's funny sometimes, but do you realize that our God is real? Our God is real. Our spirit, His Spirit is real. When we have questions about differences, do you not think He can answer those questions? The answer is yes. He can answer those questions. See, the point here is that despite their differences, their freedom to believe in in the differences they had, which today I'm calling their kingdoms. Their kingdoms were threatened, and the only way to keep them was to kill the threat. They couldn't ignore it. They couldn't ignore it. It's that child in the room screaming when you want some Peace of mind, screaming, yelling, because they want their way. (laughs) When they met, they did not deny this miracle, folks, especially this last one, but looked only at the implications to them, to their kingdoms. And they did this to the heart of eyes, heart and eyes that were selfish and sinful. They had to kill the threat. They had to kill Jesus and for perhaps the first time they were actually in agreement on something. This was the only way things could, would not change. This was the only way they could maintain the freedom of their differences And that was only by killing the truth. One commentator wrote this, the measure of freedom and autonomy they presently enjoyed, and he's talking about the Sanhedrin, the the, the measure of freedom and autonomy they presently enjoyed, as well as the privilege to maintain their own temple worship could be snatched away from them. And I think sometimes, sometimes we live there. Sometimes we live in our little kingdoms that maybe nobody knows about. And we don't want it snatched away from us. 
You know, Jesus comes to disrupt our kingdoms, folks. When he is present, there will be division. And I'm not talking about division amongst his people. I'm talking about division between sin and no sin. There will be division. You will have to make a choice. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. In the world today, this is really no different. Have the freedoms we enjoy in the United States led to our individual kingdoms outside of Christ? You know, we enjoy a lot of freedoms in the U.S., And as a result of all the laws that are passed about the freedom of speech and the freedom of thought and the freedom of religion and the freedom of freedom and the freedom of the freedom of the freedom, right? We're even, we have in laws, we even have laws for freedom of the freedoms. But I think with all these things that we have freedom of, it creates what we call tolerance. And see, I think there's too much tolerance in the world. Because there's only one truth. And I, sometimes I think we get pulled into this freedom, the Burger King have it your way mentality. When it's not my way, it's your way, Lord. It is your way. See, the, it's not a, it, 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 is, it is not a democracy. It is an autocracy. I think that's the word. It is a one, one king who, who says, I am the ruler of all things. We're not kings of our own life, folks. We don't have a kingdom. In Matthew 12, 25, he says, Jesus says, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Here's the truth for us this morning. There are only two kingdoms, folks, the devils and gods. You you, you don't have a kingdom. Let's say that together. I don't have a kingdom. I don't have a kingdom. See, you're either branded with the devil's kingdom or you're branded with God's kingdom, but there's nothing in between. We have no kingdoms except God's. Those in the world who are lost, who have their own kingdoms outside of God, they are not free but operate under the kingdom of the devil who is against God. See, we think freedom is really freedom. But see, freedom only comes through Christ. When when we say we're free and even free from Christ, then we've given ourselves to devil and guess what? You're not free. It is a catch-22, folks. There is not God and the devil and then us. It don't work that way. It's either we're gods or we're the devil's. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's true. Would you rather me speak of flowery things or speak of the truth? Praise God, because I'm going to do it anyway. Because that's what I'm called to do. That's what we are all called to do. And we're all called to live in that truth, not speak, not just speak it. What good is it if I stand up here and speak the truth and I go out and I don't live the truth? I couldn't stand here and talk about the truth. God strike me dead if that happens. I don't want that to happen. See, those in the world that are lost today who have their own kingdoms outside of God, they're not free. They operate under the devil's kingdom. If our individual or even our collective kingdoms are not based on Jesus Christ, they are based on the evil one. This may scare us a bit, and it should, but some kingdoms revolve around specific things like, yeah, I'm going I'm to start digging here a little bit, folks, so, so understand that I love you and God loves us. See, 
This may scare us a little bit, but some of these kingdoms revolve around things specifically like social and, and activist groups. Um, um, some even environmentalist groups. Some or, you know, for or against what are believed to be human rights. And there are many different variations of that. Others that say they don't get involved or, you know, you have, the, you have the extremists that actually are involved. But then you've got other people who are not Christians, but they say they don't get involved or they say they don't care about those um, and, and so don't involve themselves in those groups. Even they have their own kingdoms if they're not based on Jesus Christ. See, we, 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 the, our, our world wants to confuse all of these kingdoms. We think all of these kingdoms that we build outside of Jesus are the right ones. We build all these plethora of kingdoms in, in societies, in groups, in social groups, and all of these things, in political things. We build all of these kingdoms that are not based on Christ. And, 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 and we think they're all different and better, but at the end of the day, if they're not built on Jesus, they all are under one umbrella, evil. They're all under one umbrella, folks. If we don't do for the purpose of God, His will for His kingdom, for His advancement, not our own, for His advancement. We don't live in His kingdom. And when something disrupts our kingdoms, we're going to fight to hold on to it. I've even seen like the Pharisees and Sadducees and their differences that when these kingdoms are threatened collectively... These kingdoms that we just talked about that are in the world, people will fight for their freedom to have their kingdoms despite their differences. And, it, and it's why there's so much tolerance in the world again. You know, you see all these people who, who will have these different kingdoms in the world that are not based on Jesus Christ. When something threatens the freedom to have those differences, they'll all pull together and they'll fight. They'll fight. Now, for we believers, Jesus is very clear about the distinctions of these kingdoms. John 3.33 tells us, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. The message version puts it this way, unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. I like that message version. I'll read it again. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to. Jesus is talking to, right? To God's kingdom. There are only two kingdoms. The kingdom of God, where God's will is accomplished, and the kingdom of Satan, where we want to say Satan's kingdom is accomplished, right? But it ain't that way. I'm going to, I'll say it a different way. There are only two kingdoms. The kingdom of God where God's will is accomplished or the kingdom of Satan where our will is accomplished. See, that's the thing about us Christians sometimes. If we don't personalize things, we generalize them and they don't affect us. When you generalize something and you say us versus me, then we don't feel so much weight. But when we really grasp this gospel, and it's our gospel, and we know that Jesus loves me, because it's through me that he loves the collective we. See, there's only two kingdoms, the kingdom of God where his will is accomplished, and the kingdom of the devil where our will is accomplished. And sometimes, you know, when the empire of the kingdom of our sinful heart, a heart divided from God, is threatened, it will fight back and try to destroy the threat. It reminds me of a dog. I used to, I used to live up north, and we'd, we'd, uh, we'd, 
um, come in contact with some wild dogs sometimes. And these dogs, poor things, they were skinny and, and they were uh, hungry and they were cold and they weren't fed very well because somebody had just abandoned them and they'd grown up out there eating whatever they ate. And so somebody had just abandoned them and, and you, would, you would come near to them, you'd find them and you'd try to go near to them because your whole objective was to help them out, to give them food, and you get near them, they start growling at you. They want to attack you. Why? Because that's, they don't know you. This kingdom is all they know. This kingdom is, see, we act like wild dogs sometimes when Jesus comes in and wants to change our kingdom to help us. And we growl at him. We growl at the messenger. We growl at the teacher. We growl at other people that where God sends his message through. And, and we don't, we, sh, we need to understand that God loves us. He loves us. Jesus tells us what his presence will result in. Matthew 10, 34 tells us, this is what, you know, when we talk about Jesus, you know, I've had so many conversations with people about Jesus, and, and, and when I talk about when his presence comes, what happens? Oh, I feel this floating. And I feel this, oh, this Oh, beauty in my heart. And I'm not making light of that, folks, because it's happened to me. I felt that at the altar when I'm praying, where I'm tired and God comes over me. But, but, but my point is, is that that is the, when, when, I, when we ask that question of people, generally speaking, it's the norm, not the exception. It's the norm, not the exception. But, but all I got to do and all you have to do is, is, is go to the Word and understand when Jesus comes in the presence of man where there is sin, <laughs> that whole comforting feeling, that don't happen. That don't happen. Not in the Scripture. In fact, Matthew 10.34 tells us, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Who's talking here? Jesus. I did not come to bring peace I came to bring flowers. No, I came to bring a sword, he says. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. What? Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This is how much God loves us. What he's saying is that this sword that he brings is a sword of healing. It is a sort of healing. And because he is and brings the true healing for sin and salvation for everlasting life, it is a sword that will cut the cords of every allegiance we have that's against Christ. It will cut every allegiance we have, every kingdom we have that is against Christ. Because every allegiance we have that is not based on him, is sin. Jesus is the light that reveals truth. He's the light that reveals truth. It's so amazing to me. I bought some new light bulbs. My desk is a dark colored wood, and it's really cool because it's one of those rising desks I can stand, and but that's not the point, but it's, it's kind of cool. But anyway, so it's got, uh, it's dark, and where I have, my light is in the back of me, and so I have another light over here, but I bought some new bulbs. And, and, and these bulbs were pretty nice, so I, I, I put the bulbs in, and, and I turned it on, and, and my desk is dirty. My desk is filthy. You see, these lights revealed stuff that I didn't see before. And it's because I changed them out. You know, we need to change our light bulbs out once in a while. Amen? Get the 100-watt bulbs. I'm not talking about your home. I'm not talking about our home, Christians. This is we collectively. 
We collectively need to change our bulbs out once in a while and get 100-watt bulbs. See, this sword is a sword that brings healing, just like that light. By His presence then and in and through us now, the Lord exposes all things. He is the light of the world. But this is never with the intent to hurt us. It's never with the intent to hurt it's with the intent to first reveal. Allowing us to see and then choose salvation or not. The new light that I exchanged for the old light was never intended to hurt me when I bought it. The makers of the light intended the light to assist in revealing more brightly that I might see. This was intended to help me. It was created by man to give light, to be helpful. What was exposed by the new light in my office was not the fault of the light bulb maker. It wasn't the fault of the light. It was my fault. The light just revealed it. The kingdom of the light revealed the kingdom. The kingdom of the light Revealed the kingdom on my desk. And it was dirty. And I had a choice to clean it. Or I had a choice to remove that bulb and kill it. Smash it. Get rid of it. Put a dimmer bulb there. See, when Jesus comes... He reveals all things. And this is what he was doing to the Pharisees. This is what he was doing to the Sadducees. This is what he was doing to all the believers, to those people that were there, that they might see truth. You see, everyone gets along in their differences as long as our independent kingdoms are not threatened. Jesus came to destroy the kingdom of Satan. Do you believe that? And not only did he come to destroy it, he did destroy it. Jesus came to destroy the kingdom of Satan. However, if one happens to be living in it, they are threatened unless they see this true light, the true kingdom, the true hope of salvation for their souls that comes with believing in the kingdom of Jesus and the one he offers. The devil's kingdom that he wants outside of God, that he might be like God, from the beginning was threatened, and that's why he told Eve, did God really say? See, he wants to make us doubt about whether God's kingdom is really true. Did God really say? But freedom that, you know, to believe what we want. Freedom to worship as we please, as we choose. Freedom to live as we choose. That's not freedom at all. That's not freedom at all. There's only freedom in God's kingdom. The kingdom Jesus broke open when he died on the cross and resurrected for our sake. I'm going to say it again. I want you to hear this very clearly, folks. There's only freedom in God's kingdom. The kingdom Jesus broke open when he died on the cross and resurrected for our sake, that's the only true kingdom. The world tells us in Matthew 27, 50 through 51, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that very moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two for, from top to bottom. Jesus tore, Jesus' death tore the veil. The veil is revealing the Holy of Holies. It is the passageway between what, who couldn't go in and who could go in. The high priest was the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies. And so everybody that needed or that wanted God, even Gentiles, had to go through the priest in order to get to God. Today, God says, uh-uh, you can come directly to me. You can come. It's for everyone. His love is for everybody. The kingdom of God was now open. Access to the Holy of Holies himself through Jesus Christ was now made available for those who would believe in Jesus. Do we believe in Jesus? Do we believe that he is 
the access to his kingdom? The kingdom of salvation, the kingdom of everlasting life with our God and creator was now made accessible through the pure and holy blood of Jesus Christ for those who believe. But to believe, we must lay down our own individual kingdoms, folks. We have to lay down our kingdoms. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. You know, I know that there are I know there's struggles in our, our lives. And as you close your eyes, I want, you to, I want us to focus on, on God. Every eye closed and every head bowed. I want us to focus on God on the throne and Jesus right next to Him, at His right hand. Intercessing for us, interceding for us. That we might break our kingdoms that we might lay them down. And I know there might be some that desire this more and more from God who might be going through some struggles, through some problems, through the things in their life and their kingdoms, they, they know they've got to lay them down. That they might be empty only to be filled with God's kingdom because if we're filled with our kingdoms, God can't fill us with His. I want you to come forward and kneel at these altars Well, we go through this song that Paul's going to play for us here in a minute. But before we even do that, I want us to pray. And the altars are open, folks. The altars are open. Oh, Lord, we give you what we can today, Lord, what we know of today, what you bring to our minds today as we struggle in our own kingdoms apart from yours, Father. From the corners of our deepest shame, the empty places where we've worn your name, Lord, those, the, the scattered ashes that, that we've hidden away, we lay them all at your feet this morning, Lord. Show us the love we say that we believe in, Lord God. Help us to lay our kingdoms down. Help us to, to lay them down, Lord. Let us be where, let, let this be where we die. Let this be where we're crucified with you, Father. Oh, God, be lifted high today as our kingdoms fall. Let our kingdoms fall today. Let our kingdoms fall, Lord, in your presence. Oh, Lord, let this be once and for all. Not a one-time thing. Let it be forever, Lord. Let it be once and for all. God, our Father of all creation, let this be once and for all, Father. Jesus. The scattered ashes that I hid away. Yes. I lay it all at your feet. Hallelujah. Jesus. From the corners of my deep shame, Jesus, the empty places where I warn your name, show me the love, say I believe, yes, Lord, help me to lay it down. Oh, Lord, I lay it down. Oh, let this be. victory in my Savior's law 
in the crimson flowing from the cross. Yes. Pour over me. Yes, Lord. Pour over me. Yes. Oh, let this be. This is our desire. This is our prayer, Lord. Let us take soberly your kingdom, Father. It is the only truth. It is the only way. It is the only life. Help us to live in this world, but not be of it. Help our kingdoms to be united in one kingdom and that's yours we don't have our own kingdom Lord God Jesus we need you more than ever before we need you today there are so many struggles that people are going through I know it and as I pray every day I feel it I know there are struggles but God you overcame you overcame. Lord, we need you more and more to overcome what we think are the right kingdoms. We need you to show us day after day as we get into your word, as we pray that there is only one kingdom and that is yours, Father God. We lay it all down, as the song says, once and for all. We have no more kingdom, Lord. Let it be our prayer. Let it be our anthem. Let it be our word, Lord. Thank you, Father, for all you've done and all you are and all you will do. We pray these things in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all his people said, Amen. Amen. Go in God's peace and seek God's kingdom first and all his righteousness and all other things will be given unto you. Amen. Amen. God bless you.